Welcome. I'm Warno Deschalet, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. Welcome to A Baha'i Perspective. I recorded an interview with Tadia Rice on May 24, 2021. Tadia co-produced and performed the musical drama A Woman and Her Words, a theater production based on the true story of Tahereh, a woman whose compelling but obscure life has been hidden from the Western world until now, who was a 19th century notable Persian poetess and Eastern woman writer. Tahereh was one of the first 18 disciples of the Bab, the forerunner to Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. Tahereh was far ahead of her time, and in spite of her untimely and tragic death, her courage remains an inspiration to all. In the musical drama, historical events of the 19th century Western world are juxtaposed against the dramatic circumstances of Tahereh's life in Persia, allowing the audience a more global context with which to relate to the story of an Eastern woman who defied convention. After retiring the production, Tadia co-produced the soundtrack CD entitled A Woman and Her Words, The Story of Tahereh. Subsequently, she produced a second CD of Tahereh's poems put to music entitled Solace of the Eyes, The Songs of Tahereh. It's from this second CD that we feature selections in the interview. Tadia is also a global business consultant and host of the radio program Womanosity for Women with Curiosity on Woman Radio that broadcasts globally. I started the interview by asking Tadia where she grew up and what was religious life like growing up. I grew up in Arizona in the Southwest Desert. I was exposed to lots of different cultures, mostly Native American, Hispanic, and individuals from Africa that knew my family. My religious life was kind of peculiar because my family was many religions, Coptic, Baptist, Catholic, and Presbyterian. And whenever they got together, they would always fight about who was going to go to hell because they knew that each other would, but they would not. So it taught me very early on that religion can be a very unusual and conflict-ridden thing. So by the time I was 12, I had become an atheist. Mm. And so I knew that I was looking for something, and I just needed to find it, and I didn't know how or where that would be, because I was 12 at that point. What do you know when you're 12, you know? But when I was 15 years old in high school, the teacher brought in several clergy members because we were studying different religions. I look back on it now and realize how very progressive that teacher was, and I don't even remember their name. But several clergy came to class to speak to the class about what their religion was about. And among them was a rabbi and a priest and a Baha'i. I was very, very bored when the rabbi and the priest spoke, and none of it fell on my ears with any kind of acceptance or agreement. However, when this individual person spoke who was a Baha'i, it was truly like the room had gone dark, and there was a light that connected the two of us together, and I felt he was speaking directly to me, and only to me. It was in the 60s, so the social beliefs of the Baha'i faith really caught my attention. The equality of men and women, the elimination of all prejudice, that mankind was one, that there should be no racism, that there was only one unknowable, all-powerful essence, and some people call it God and some people call it other things. But this resonated with me, so I decided then that if ever I were to believe in God, because remember, I was an atheist, I would become a Baha'i. And of course, I never gave it a second thought after that until a few years later. Well, that Baha'i was Phil Lucas, who at the time was a young performer around the Phoenix area. He was an actor. He eventually became a writer, producer, and director, and an editor of hundreds of films and documentaries, 
for PBS exploring the problems of Indian stereotypes perpetuated by Hollywood Westerns. Now, I had been raised next to the Phoenix Indian School where he had attended. It was a terribly damaging institution and a horrendous experience for the children that were sent to it. Like all Indian schools across America, it was truly a horrendous punishment for children. Well, it would be 30 years later while I was at Boshba High School in Northern California that I would lay eyes on Phil Lucas again. And it was absolutely glorious. It was just wonderful because here was this man who really opened the door to the greater world for me. What was your spiritual journey that took you from hearing Phil speak in your class to you actually embracing the Baha'i faith as your faith? You know, our spiritual journeys are so individual and so unique. No one has the same journey. Any Baha'i who tells you how they became a Baha'i, there will never be a duplicate because everybody comes to this belief tradition in their own way, at their own time, for the needs that they have. It was about four years after high school that I would be living in Washington, D.C., where for some reason, I don't even know why, I decided I'd look up the Baha'i community because I thought, hmm, I really liked how that sounded, the Baha'i religion. I agreed with all those things they said. It was so progressive. And in the 60s, indeed, it was very, very progressive. The oneness of humanity, how to solve economic problems with a spiritual solution, and how to eliminate greed, and how to bring women into a position of equity and partnership, of equality. And so I called up the Baha'i community in Washington, D.C. They were having a party for the youth. I was invited. I went. Bam. It was so <laughs> great. I loved everybody I met. It was so much fun. So I decided to become a Baha'i. However, there was a catch. I still was an atheist, and I still didn't believe in God. It would be another five years of being an active Baha'i, mind you, that I really understood what embracing the belief system of Baha'u'llah meant. I was in Cairo, Egypt at that point. The Baha'is who had taken me in did it at their peril because they had just been released from prison because they were Baha'is. That was the religious persecution of the fundamentalist Islamic regime in Egypt. I had no clue what danger I could have put them in by being there. But they took the risk. They took me in. I was traveling around East Africa, finding my roots. I realized then, when I learned their story, that they did not recant their religion. They were told, hey, all you have to do is say you're not a Baha'i. Just say you're not a Muslim, and we'll give you jobs, we'll give you a nice place to live, we'll give you everything you possibly need and want, but you can't be a Baha'i. I had been a pretty much of a revolutionary and a rabble rouser, and I marched in a lot of protests and boycotts. I was speaking to this marvelous human being, Dr. Azawi, who had been sent to Egypt from Iran by Shoghi Effendi, who was a major administrator in the Baha'i religion at that time. And he was there because he believed in Baha'u'llah. I said to him as he was telling me his story, I said, well, why didn't you just say you weren't a Baha'i? As those words fell out of my mouth, I shrunk in my soul. I recognized, what are you saying, you idiot? You, you were willing to die for the Vietnam War and less for the great boycott. And you won't stand up for what you believe and be as brave and courageous as these people? Are you going to walk your talk or not? It's truly in that moment, it became clear to me that if you really do believe in a religious prophecy, if you really do believe in accepting that in this day and age, Christ has returned, Muhammad has returned, Buddha has returned, Krishna, all of the great religious teachers of the past, their messages have been updated with every subsequent 
great teacher that changes civilization in the world. And here I was living in the nascent days of the Baha'i Faith, very early on, really, you know, 100, 100, maybe 15, 20 years old at that point. And I couldn't stand up for what I believed in. Well, (laughs) I was beyond humbled. And I realized then I am a Baha'i. Yeah, you better get on it and get over your issue with God and really figure out who you are and how you want to manifest what you say you believe in. So that was my journey. So, Tadia, you produced a musical album called Solace of the Eyes. What is the theme behind this album? There were actually two CDs that were produced that were results of a play that I had written. So let me just backtrack a moment to tell you what happened. Solace of the Eyes and A Woman and Her Words were two musical projects. As I finally gained some depth in the Baha'i faith, I started studying who the people were in the earliest days when this revelation in the 1800s took place. And one of them was a woman named Tahire. It would be 30 years from the time I first learned about the faith in high school to the time that I really found out who she was. It would be in 1993. It was 30 years span, but I heard about her. I heard of her. But no one really could tell you much. Well, that's because her poetry had not been translated into English or released to the public until 1993. Fortunately for me, the translators became a gift to me and they changed my life because there were several of them. One of them asked me to recite Tahereh's poems in English at a tribute to this remarkable heroine of Persia, Tahereh, which means the pure one in the Arabic language. And it is actually a title that was bestowed upon her along with others. But Tahereh's poetry that I was able to read evolved into my being captivated, literally captivated. I read her poetry as it came out of the fax machine, and something impacted my person, my soul. And I read the words, and it was as though I was reading a language I had never read before. So as I studied her poetry, I then wanted to tell the story. And I had been telling the story with one of the translators, Dr. Amin Banani, and I had been the first woman's voice in which the poetry had been heard. And I asked him, could we keep doing this? And he said, no, we didn't want to keep going to conferences and and lecturing. He said, but you do it. You, you go. You go tell the story of Tahere. (laughs) He was like a dad, you know, shoving his kid onto the playground. Yeah, you go. Try the monkey bars. Well, in trying to give Tahere a voice today, it ended up that I discovered my own. During the creative process, there were constant affirmations of the power of Tahere. She was the sole female disciple in the Babi religion. Now, that preceded what became the Baha'i faith, which originated in Persia in the early 1800s. She was this sole woman amongst men who were his disciples, the Bab's disciples. Her best friend, was Baha'u'llah. Now, Baha'u'llah was the founder, prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. At the time, she knew who Baha'u'llah would become, but others didn't. She fell in love with the message of the Bab and became a Babi, B-A-B-I. And being a Babi then meant that you broke from Islam that you basically changed everything about Islam and inaugurated a new era, a new, more modern perception of what the world and life should be and how humanity should operate. So Tyre was very remarkable, more remarkable, I think, than most people even today realize. Her spiritual power and scholastic aptitude was both stunning and appalling to the men in her world because 
in a time and place, Persian girls were not allowed to go to school or study. Persian women did not enjoy any freedoms. Tahereh was different. She had been educated by her father, and her mother had actually been educated. But the education that her father gave her, which was to become an Islamic and religious scholar, which he was, ended up being his dismay. She became one of the most learned of all the Islamic and religious scholars of her time. What complicated it was that she was called the most beautiful woman in Persia. And the poetry that she had written and performed and shared was praised. But at the same time, she was becoming a spiritual leader and a spiritual revolutionary. Her poetry, her teachings, they all called for education of all people, equality of all people. She called for the end of slavery. She called for religious freedom. All those things alone threatened the very foundation of Persian theocracy. And this led to her persecution and untimely murder in Tehran, carried out in secret in late August of 1852, when she was only 36 years old. So as I was learning the fuller story of Tahereh, I knew that it had to be told. So I created a music drama called A Woman and Her Words, The Story of Tahereh, never meaning to be a playwright, never meaning to be a performer, never meaning for any of this. It was completely unintentional. But when Tahereh taps you, she taps you. Mm. So for 10 years, I and my co-stars and various other actors in the play would tour around the world. I retired the play in 2000. Then the soundtrack recording was born. I believed that in addition to the recording of the musical drama, which was a stage show, a stage play, I believed that some of the songs from the drama could stand on their own without any dramatic narrative. So I created a spin-off CD called Solace of the Eyes, The Songs of Tahereh. So both A Woman and Her Words, The Story of Tahereh and Solace of the Eyes, The Songs of Tahereh were released at the same time. It ended up, they competed for 10 Grammy nominations the very first year, very first effort, unbelievable. And I couldn't have really done it without the mentorship and excellence of Ellis Hall Jr., who is the most remarkable co-composer, co-producer, and music arranger. He is a multi-instrumentalist. He's an actor. He's been lauded by Ray Charles and Stevie Wonder and Tower of Power, James Taylor, Earth, Wind, and Fire, so many, many more. And he is sightless together, working with him being his eyes and him being his magical hands that he was, we were able to discover ways to create music that would befit the power of Tahereh's words and continue to maintain an authentic Eastern influence, but combined with contemporary overtones of jazz, non-rock vocals, old spiritual sounds, that would reflect ethereal and sometimes haunting arrangements and tempos that fit parts of Tahereh's journey. So, Tadia, I want to feature musical pieces from Solace of the Eyes in the interview. And the first one we're going to play is Sands of Time. So what should we listen for when we hear this piece? You know, in the lyrics, well, I should say in the poem, she says, Tahereh says, There is an endless circle of life, and it's God who measures out the sands of time. I love singing this poem. It's such a beautiful song. On stage, I would use a large hourglass sitting on a table next to me. It was full of sand in the upper chamber, and the bottom chamber was empty, clear glass. I would turn it over as I began to sing the song, and as the sand would fall to the bottom chamber, I would sing. It was a visual metaphor of Tahereh's meaning that no matter who we are, no matter what we do, no matter what we have, we only have a certain amount of time to make our lives meaningful. So this is Sands of Time. Stars 
will fall The sun will rise Like sands of time A thousand stars Watch the moon rise On mystic shores So we're listening to the uh, musical arrangements from the album Solace of the Eyes that was produced by Tadia Rice. She's also a global business consultant and host of the radio program Womanosity for Women with Curiosity on woman radio broadcasting globally. Tadia, the next musical selection is called If We Could Meet and then in parentheses dot by dot. So what's the significance of the dot by dot? There have been two titles for it. The reason for it is because it's impossible to know for a fact the time and place of when she wrote her poetry. However, knowing her life story, I felt very strongly when she would write them because of the circumstances that occurred in her life. Being the only female disciple of the Bob, she was the only one of those disciples, there were 18, that could never meet him, would never meet him. It was impossible given time and place. She could not, as a woman, ever go and just meet him. He was imprisoned, he was tortured, he was secreted away. I really believe that this poem 
dot by dot, which has also been called If We Could Meet, is her testament to the grief, to her pain of the loss of knowing she will never see his face. She writes about it in very severe terms. She's kept away from him. Her heart is tormented, yet his love is woven into every fiber of the fabric of her life, every knot and strand and dot, if she could only meet him. So that's my interpretation. It is called dot by dot in Persian or point by point, again, depending on the translation and transliteration. But that's the essence of the song. So we're listening to the music from the album Solace of the Eyes that was produced by Tadia Rice, and she sings the poetry of Tahare, a 19th century heroic figure of the Babi faith. Tadia is also a global business consultant and host of the radio program Womanosity for Women with Curiosity on the woman radio broadcasting globally. And we had just listened to the musical piece dot by dot. So, Tadia, the next musical selection is A Voice Cries. So tell us about this one. Again, we have no way of knowing the dates of any of Tahereh's poems, but again, this poem provided a strong sense, like all of them did, 
I can only speculate about the circumstances that Tahereh's words reflected. Of course, I sequenced the poems where I thought they fit the drama that told her story. But in 1841, when Tahereh was 24, she embraced the belief that an Islamic one would soon be revealed. And this is a a Quranic prophecy. The Islamic world at the time was pregnant with expectation that the Quran's prophecies would be fulfilled by the return of the spirit of Muhammad. And she tells everybody who will listen to her that there's going to be a promised one who's going to appear. This is what she taught and what she believed. And then there would be another one that would fulfill the prophecies of all of the holy books, the Torah, the Bible, the Quran. She knew in her soul that this individual would bring teachings for a new age. So as she with the other individuals who had been studying, who were Quranic scholars, embraced the Bab as this first revealed manifestation, she became one of the leaders. She also became one of the most influential and controversial leaders of the movement, and really in all of Persia, as a woman who broke every rule. By this time, she was 24, she had children. She was forcefully married to her cousin, which was very common in that society and culture. By this time, her husband, who was a devout Muslim, and his family, his father, her uncle, also her father-in-law, was a mullah at the top of the hierarchy of Islamic clergy. Her husband demanded she obey. Her husband demanded that she denounce these beliefs. Her husband demanded that she not in any way socialize with women or anyone. Well, she didn't stop, of course. And within two years, her husband took her children away from her. Eventually, she divorced him, which was against Islamic law, but quite a scene, actually, in the drama. Her life appeared to be collapsing at this juncture, but she remained unshaken, and she continued to spread her message that he would come. Now, the he would be the Bab and also Baha'u'llah. The song of voice cries, I believe is indeed Tahereh's expression of distress and pain and sorrow, while at the same time, her passion and her love being guided toward a path being lit for her on a new day. Knowing her life was not going to be normal or long, she expressed it in a voice cries. These are all her words.
So we're listening to the music from the album Solace of the Eyes that was co-produced by Tadia Rice and Ellis Hall Jr. And Tadia is also a global business consultant and host of the radio program Womanosity for Women with Curiosity on Woman Radio that broadcasts globally. So Tadia, the next piece I'd like to feature is Rise Up and Sing. So tell us about this one. One spring night, Tahire writes that she had a vivid and wondrous dream where she saw a young man floating in midair, appearing out of nowhere, that his face was beautiful, that he had dark eyes and delicate features, and that he wore a green turban. Now, in Islamic belief, green is the color of Muhammad, and the descendants of Muhammad wear green turbans. The Bob was a descendant of Muhammad, and he wore a green turban. In this dream, Tahereh was so captivated by his words that she immediately memorized them. She knew that he was the promised one. Soon after, she read this tablet of verses that were written by a young man with those verses as in her dream. She knew then that he was indeed the promised one, the Bob. She wanted to tell all the people that this was a new age for social equality, that this was the time to rise up and sing. And that was her very clear message that, as her lyric says, secrets will shine from awakening time, for he will come in this day. This is her pronouncement. Rise up, dear friend Like the strong branch of a tree Knowledge will bring you I will help guide you To the one who will make all secrets clear Rise up and sing Rise up, dear friend. Rise 
been listening to the music from the album Solace of the Eyes, The Songs of Tahere, that was co-produced by Tadia Rice and Ellis Hall Jr. And Tadia is also a global business consultant and host of the radio program Womanosity for Women with Curiosity on Woman Radio that broadcasts globally. So, Tadia, tell us about the musical drama you created called A Woman and Her Words. A Woman and Her Words came in three nights to me as I was trying to write her story. I didn't know what form it would take. I just knew that I wanted to share her poetry and share her story. So it was an outgrowth of my passion to reveal who she was to the world that didn't yet know about her. I spent five years researching Tahere, and I was able to work with numerous translators of her poetry who were both Baha'is and non-Baha'is, even Muslim. I was privileged to have the support of the Baha'i International Center located in Haifa, Israel. I was able to then create an appropriate storytelling that was accurate in every way. So through music and narration, the drama told the story of this incredible woman who transcended not only time, but space and gender and the religious dogma of her day. The narrative story that used Tahereh's own poetry conveyed her life experience of a creative and unique woman who was often misunderstood, who often suffered for it. Ultimately, Tahereh was murdered unwillingly in a predetermined death that only she understood, and she foretold it. But she left a legacy through her words, and that power remains so great that she continues to be praised and recognized around the globe today. She was not just a brilliant legal scholar, theologian, writer, and poetess, but she occupied this spiritual station and great status that we as Baha'is still don't fully appreciate. But it's interesting that the public, when watching the show, immediately would understand she was a powerful person who helped establish a new religious movement. The audience learned how great her impact not only was then, but still continues to be today. Some audience members told me that they considered Tahereh a holy person, and they had no background information about her other than what they saw on a stage in an hour and a half play. Their experience seeing the show, they would often say, was a holy experience for them. I understand that because Tahereh became part of my life. She animated and transformed my life in ways I couldn't have ever anticipated, but I know I was blessed to experience. As her words continue to echo in my mind, whether or not I'm on a stage, I still sing them, I still speak about her. Her expressions live in me as I try to animate her poetry and punctuate her prose in my voice that provides her voice a vehicle. The narrative script of the show would move the story forward through the songs. So my dear and wonderful co-stars would tell the story as a character, and then I would sing the song, and there would be different scenes, again, that explained how her husband, her father, her uncle, how the Shah at the time treated her and the demands that were made of her. The historical setting takes place with the blend of ethnic music from around the world. The script weaves the story of Tahereh's life into significant historical events around the world that help change societies around the globe. So whatever was happening in her life at the time is also conveyed of what was happening in the world the women's movement, the revolutions, the creation of countries, whether it was in Hawaii or Africa. It was the time of Shaka Zulu and King Kamehameha and many historical global impacts that occurred at the time. The overriding message, though, is one of social justice and the unity of humanity. That was Tahereh's message, social justice and the unity of humanity that it all exceeded gender limitations. There was no place about gender or feminism in her poems. She has many times been 
depicted as a feminist. She was not a feminist. She never spoke about women. She spoke about humanity, about people, about the freedom of the soul and the spirit. The show traveled around the world. At least 5,000 people had seen it live. It performed in theaters throughout North America, Hawaii, South Africa, Botswana, Swaziland, plus faculties and students of universities around the globe and numerous presentations and lectures that I've given on television, off television, on radio. It's really funny that there's a cable television station in Hawaii that is still watching my earliest show from 1997. What is it about Tahare that inspired you to create your art around this woman? <laughs> I wasn't an artist when I started. I wasn't a performer. I wasn't a singer. I wasn't a musician. I wasn't a composer. All of that came because Tahire helped me become. You founded an association by her name, the Tahare Association. Can you tell us about the Tahare Association? Yes. When I retired the show because of various conditions and circumstances, the show, A Woman in Her Words, The Story of Tahare, I retired it in 2000 and I knew I couldn't stop telling her story. So I decided to create a nonprofit. So I called it the Tahare Association. This could extend the legacy of Tahare's commitment to educate others. So the Tahare Association is very specific in its dedication to promoting the vision of the real-life heroine, Tahare. Her time that she lived, she only lived from 1815 to 1852 in Persia. She didn't live long. She was 36 years old when she was murdered. She was one of the earliest women in the struggle for human rights and equality. As a 19th century Persian poetess and legal scholar, she actually had been named Joan of Arc of the Eastern World. Very interesting. She was really what we would call a transformational leader by today's standards. She called for social and religious freedom at a time when she herself was not allowed such rights. But it's her courage, commitment to justice, and sacrifice that is so inspiring to all who learn her story. It doesn't matter who they are. So we created the motto, teach a girl, change the world. Mm -hmm. So we give scholarships to women and girls around the world who demonstrate excellence in either artistic expression, technology, science, any of the arts, really any field. We want to find and acknowledge really impressive girls and women who are already agents of change in their own communities. We don't look at grades. We're not judging the scholarship by typical standards. We've had recipients from 11 years old to 76 years old, from fifth graders to postgraduate students. We try and give scholarships every year and since our beginning. We've awarded 32 of them to girls and women located in six countries. We also have some service programs from time to time I have run one of the programs for 10 years in Hawaii's only women's prison, and that is the Tahare Association's Beyond Bars program. This offers educational skills at a higher level to incarcerated women, and it offers presentation techniques, acting, and improvisational skills to the women who are incarcerated. And I've been doing that since 2011. It has been a joy and a wonder. And when the women learn about Tahere, knowing that she had been incarcerated, imprisoned, and executed, knowing that they were in prison for their crime, when they learn about her crimes, they really reflect on what is worth going to prison for. How much do you believe in what you're doing at the time you're doing it? So there's a lot of reflection that comes, a lot of empowerment that comes with her story. We've also supported research for a very historic one-hour documentary film called Wednesdays in Mississippi based on the book. It's an all-woman production, and it examines the quiet revolution that took place in the summer of 1964 in Mississippi when a group of black and white women reached across the chasm of race, class, geography, and religion to end segregation in America 
by registering voters. So those are just a few of the things we do. Our staff is all volunteer. All donations are 100% tax deductible. We try and just do the work and keep plodding along. Not a lot of glitz and glamour, but definitely rewarding. And is there a website to go to for Tahare Association? That's it, tahareassociation.org, T-A-H-I-R-I-H, association.org. So, Tadia, tell me about your radio program, Womanosity for Women with Curiosity. Well, it's exactly as it is titled. (laughs) It's a two-hour weekly show where I interview remarkable women from every walk of life all over the world. It might be a diplomat. It might be uh, remarkable historic women judges who have evolved mediation technique into now the mainstream. It could be actresses who have portrayed characters of great women. It might be scientists, tech women, women in STEM in Africa, women in Austria who produce films, women in Canada who are Cree, who are trying to educate others about cultural beliefs and traditions, could be anybody anywhere, but all women, and women who do remarkable things, not necessarily famous, but certainly who have impact in the world. So the audience gets to learn from them, listen to the stories, and as I tell my listeners, live, love, and learn. Always remain curious. Never stop learning. Well, Tadia, thank you for spending this time telling us all about the work that you do. It sounds great. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Tadia Rice international business consultant, radio show host, and creator of two musical CDs from the works of the 19th century poetess Tahare. You can find this interview and other interviews on the website abahaiperspective.com and on the YouTube channel A Baha'i Perspective. You can also find the podcast on Spotify and iTunes. For information specifically on the Baha'i faith, you can go to the website baha'i.org. Or you can call the number 1-800-22-UNITE. I hope you join me next time on A Baha'i Perspective. (music) 